To be honest, I was really tempted to invest in psychedelic stocks, but at the same time, I was morally conflicted. I even tried justifying it to myself, like, what if I invested in these psychedelic stocks, but then donated all my gains from these stocks into organizations that I actually cared about? <laughs> I think because I've been such a big proponent of psychedelics for so long, to be able to legitimize my psychedelic use and advocacy in terms of money made, especially to those people who looked down on me for psychedelics in the past, was another underlying motive for me to invest kind of like a monetary I told you so and I'm not telling you what to do with your money it's your money so you do what you want with it like as I say this is not financial advice I just wanted to share the reasons why I am not investing in these psychedelic stocks at this moment and I'm still learning I don't know everything I haven't looked closely into every single psychedelic stocks company and I can't say that I never will but it's very 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 unlikely that I will invest in psychedelic companies in the future. Now I'm open to seeing if people can change my mind about this but after spending some time reading about this and listening to conversations about this and talking with others in the psychedelic community about this and also lurking in the psychedelic stocks subreddits and discord servers this is where I've landed in my stance. I have heard about this issue here and there in the psychedelic community but I never looked into it as deeply as I have this past month until the whole GME Wall Street bet shit show. Now I'm a regular reddit user, I'm active on the psychedelic related subreddits um, and then all of a sudden these Wall Street bets people came onto the psychedelic subreddits during the whole GME period and started trying to convince others to buy psychedelic stocks. At that point it became harder for me to ignore it like this became one of the top posts on our shrooms at one point and I was just like are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> so now these people directed my attention back to the psychedelic corporate space and I thought this would be an opportune time to really look into it and figure out how I really felt about it. Looking at this highly upvoted post on our Wall Street bets it makes it seem like psychedelic stocks are a great thing. They have great potential as medicines for things like PTSD, depression, anxiety, ADHD, and a myriad of other things. Um, it almost makes it seem like psychedelics can cure almost anything. And you know there are a ton of people who are dealing with mental health issues like this that could benefit from things like psychedelic therapy and therefore there's a lot of money to be made there especially in these coronavirus times am I right? And yeah, these things are slowly but surely becoming decriminalized city by city, which shows that support is growing for it and the stigma is going down and these things are becoming more mainstream. Also, we have people like Peter Thiel and Shark Tank Kevin O'Leary investing in these psychedelic stocks and becoming outspoken proponents for them and these people know money, so what are the downsides here? I knew there were medical trials going on with psychedelics and MDMA, though I was mostly aware of MAPS back then at the time and it seemed like every year there are more and more of these trials happening and the results seem to be more and more promising. Medicalization as a form of legitimacy for psychedelics just made sense to me back in the day. It's a way to prove that not only are these drugs not harmful but they could also be helpful and you know schedule one drugs are deemed to not have any medicinal value so this could also help them get off that schedule one. I didn't see how this could be problematic until I started going to the NYC psychedelic society meetups and I met people there who shared criticisms of the medicalization model for psychedelics for the first time that I had ever heard and it was all new to me and I didn't really know what to make of it at the time. Then I went to the Horizons conference in 2019 and there was a panel there called Economic Models for the Expansion of Psychedelics. I don't remember much of it honestly but what I do remember is that George Goldsmith who is a co-founder for Compass Pathways was there and the audience was really not a fan of him. <laughs> After the panel a guy that I was sitting next to asked me what I thought about it and I was like I really don't know still. <laughs> because even if these companies motives were money if they expanded therapy and research, then that's still a net positive, right? Then during the pandemic, I started attending these virtual talks that highlighted how there weren't a lot of BIPOC representation in these trials, and it's not because they weren't allowed to participate, but you know, it's kind of uncomfortable going to these medical trials and not really seeing people who look like you, and also the therapists there were mostly white and they weren't aware, they weren't really trained on issues that affect BIPOC. And then there was a question of, well, why is this even a discussion right now? Like, at least these trials are happening at all, so eventually we will try to get BIPOC included here. But these talks really stress about how having BIPOC representation 
should be one of the forefront issues here um, because all these things are intrinsically tied together. They've been tied together ever since indigenous people have been demonized for their drug use and it's also tied to the drug war and how that was used to justify incarcerating a lot of BIPOC, thereby causing a lot of intergenerational trauma and PTSD in these communities. And the psychedelic community likes to say, you know, we are all one and all is love, um, but then doesn't that mean that we should really care about those who have been especially prejudiced and discriminated against for their drug use. And then fast forward to last month with the GME stuff and then I started doing my own research and this is what I learned. Now when I say nonprofit versus for-profit organizations, what I really mean is what Symposia likes to call cooperative versus non-cooperative organizations because there can also be nonprofits who have these problems and there can also be for-profits like your local therapy clinic who still have to make a profit and make money off their services but they're not necessarily trying to scale or expand out. So when I say for-profit companies, I'm talking about companies like Compass Pathways and MindMed who will be taking money from investors and therefore prioritizing profits and acting competitively as a result. So now to address the first point about how these companies are all advancing scientific research in regards to psychedelics. Sounds pretty good on paper, right? The reality is that as a company with investors, your number one priority is going to be making profit because that's why your investors are investing because they expect to make a profit. What that means is that if you discover, for instance, some way to make a synthetic compound like psilocybin, which is really important for FDA quality control standards, then you will be incentivized to patent that and not share it with other researchers. Or you could allow other researchers to use it at a cost, but any credit or monetary gain they get from their studies will go to you. And this goes for any research or important findings that you do as a for-profit. You won't want to share it with your competitors, especially because things like making synthetic psilocybin or getting FDA approval is really freaking expensive. And you can say, well, competition is good for innovation, but in this case, it's kind of against the idea of open science because you're delaying other researchers from doing their research and therefore it can impede scientific progress overall. The example I said with synthetic psilocybin is a problem that's happening right now. Compass has their own patent on their synthetic psilocybin and so other research organizations are slowed down now because now they have to spend time making their own synthetic psilocybin. Like, can you imagine what would have happened if Compass just like let them use it? How much further we could be in our scientific research because of that? So there actually exists a statement on open science and open proxies with psilocybin, MDMA, and similar substances because there were people who were afraid of this kind of non-cooperative science. And in the statement, it talks about things like, we will report the truth, we will put service over personal gain, we will not withhold materials or knowledge for a commercial advantage, and we will put our discoveries on the public domain. And there are a lot of researchers and organizations who have signed this, but notably no for-profit companies have. You know, it's not really necessary for for-profit companies to be at the forefront of psychedelic scientific research. Nonprofits like MAPS and USONA have been doing this for a really long time now, and yes, they do struggle with raising money, but it's not impossible, and a lot of the research they've done and a lot of the work with the FDA has actually paved the way for these for-profit companies to now swoop in more easily into the space. Now when you hear the word patent as an investor, that sounds like a good thing, right? It sounds like this company is the only company that can do this and therefore they're going to make a lot of money off of it. But if you claim to be doing this research for scientific progress for the greater good, then patents are kind of like the antithesis to that. There have been some controversial patents put out in terms of psychedelics and most recently with Compass Pathways. Like I made a TikTok about this, but essentially Compass put out a patent application for things like a good sound system or hand holding or having soft furniture in the room while doing psychedelic therapy. And they're trying to patent that as their own psychedelic therapeutic model, but really that's pretty standard and it's just called having a good trip setting. And while this is pretty unlikely to be approved, the people who are approving patents actually are not really the most informed people about the things that they are approving. So some of these sneaky patents can get through and that's why these companies make such broad patents to see what they can sneak through. But it's kind of messed up that Compass Pathways even tried to patent those things in the first place. Like hypothetically, if those patents did get improved, then you can imagine like only in their clinics with psychedelic therapy can there be things like soft furniture. And so people who are looking to do psychedelic therapy, of course they'll want to go somewhere with soft furniture so 
companies can then charge a lot of money for that. So you can see how patents are a way to put profit over actually healing the most amount of people. Another thing these for-profit companies like to say is that we need to scale as fast as possible. We need to get this therapy out to everyone ASAP. And that also sounds like a great idea on the surface, right? But thinking as a for-profit company, in order to scale to that size, you're going to have to try to figure out how to save money and cut costs when you can, especially when you're competing against other companies that are offering psychedelic therapy. What that could lead to, I believe, is a decrease in quality for psychedelic treatment and even psychedelic integration, which is really, really important. You can imagine that would mean training psychedelic therapists for a shorter amount of time, for instance. And you know, there aren't even a lot of psychedelic therapists out there to begin with, so a for-profit company who's trying to cut costs might be like, okay, well, even though you don't have any experience with psychedelics, I mean, sure, you can conduct these psychedelic therapy sessions, but it's really, really recommended for psychedelic therapists and even just like plain old trip sitter or trip guide to have had experience with psychedelics themselves. You could also imagine that could mean that the integration after your psychedelic therapy session could be shorted or reduced to like an app experience um, that will check up on you to further reduce costs. Now these are all hypothetical of course, there aren't really any companies saying that, although MindMed is really pushing telehealth right now, but it's just what I'm scared about and like to me scaling out doesn't always mean that you can retain that same quality. The other thing I want to address in terms of scalability is the idea that these for-profit companies say a lot when they cite these figures like this many people are suffering from mental health issues and depression as if they are the answer and they will be able to cure all these people magically with these psychedelic treatments. But the reality is that not everyone will be able to afford this psychedelic therapy and some people say well over time it will get cheaper especially with competition. And why I know not everyone will be able to afford psychedelic therapy is because not everyone can even afford normal ass regular therapy right now. Like I'm make decent money and a therapy session for me costs $40 with insurance per session. Without insurance, it'd be $120 per session. How the heck is psychedelic therapy going to be cheaper than that? There are people in the United States who can't even afford basic health care. And you know, mostly these people who don't have health insurance and who are homeless are mostly BIPOC who've been fucked over by the drug war, but they're also included in these statistics. They won't be able to afford this therapy. And I'm not trying to compare people's trauma, but these people are often overlooked when we do talk about mental health, but they are also suffering as well. And if you really care about healing everyone's suffering, including them, you'd be trying to figure out how to make it accessible to them as well. But the reality is that as these psychedelic drugs are becoming more mainstream, Previously, the like rich white people who demonize these drugs now see how they can benefit them and they're like, ah, let's try to figure out how to make this legal, but really it would only be legal for them to use. Now one way for BIPOC to access healing with psychedelics would be to make sure that these substances are decriminalized so people don't have to fear going to jail if they use them or they can more cheaply home grow their own mushrooms for instance. Now as a for-profit psychedelic company whose main goal is maximizing profits, decriminalization would actually work against your best interests. Now it's kind of weird to me because when you do go to the psychedelic stock subreddits, the posts about decriminalization news gets highly upvoted and people are like, hell yeah, the stigma is going down and now more people will be open to psychedelic therapy and they're going to buy these stocks and the price will go up and we're going to heal the world. But actually decrim would mean that while well, you could go to a psychedelic clinic or facility or service to do psychedelic therapy, you would also do some self-treatment and healing on your own and you wouldn't have to pay these psychedelic companies for that to just legally get high. So the CEO of MindMed has said that he doesn't want anything to do with those people who are pushing for decriminalization and he'd rather focus on changing public perception by going through the FDA route um, to getting the psychedelics legalized. And there are a few people on the psychedelic stock subreddits and discord servers who are self-aware and would agree with this. For instance, I saw this on the Shroom Stocks discord. And in some ways I kind of appreciate the honesty, like, yeah, I'm just here for the money, no facade of doing this for the greater good. But yeah, it worries me that a for-profit company would be against decriminalization, even if they say that they aren't, because they would want people to go to them to legally get high and not be able to do it on their own. And Jay Ron, the CEO of MyMed, has said that he's not against the decrim people, he just wants to focus on his route of therapy and healing. And all right, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that this is what he really cares about. For me, I guess I think more about what is the root cause for people's suffering and pain and how do you cure that 
So more of a focus on prevention than healing, I guess, although both are important. And to me, a form of that prevention is decriminalization and in some ways legalization, although it depends what you mean by legalization, like I just illustrated. Like there's this idea that the FDA approval is the only way we can get these psychedelics to the mainstream, but I think that's kind of a really Western scientific viewpoint, which is valid, but there are also other valid viewpoints as well. And decriminalization is happening even without full FDA approval right now. And I get that FDA approval from like a scientific looking doctor type person could make people feel more comfortable with psychedelics and therefore could open up more potential for healing. But then I think for myself that the trajectory for universal acceptance of psychedelics is already on its way. A lot of these for-profit companies create this sense of urgency, like we have to get it out now, now, now. But I think that we really need to pause and think about the path that we're going on and is this the right path? Like with cannabis, we have some places where people can buy weed legally, but in those same places, there are still people who are in jail just from possessing weed. That's a form of suffering too, and is that really the kind of world that I want for psychedelics? And now going back to the idea that these psychedelic therapies will heal people. I believe they can, but think about it from the perspective of a for-profit company who's trying to maximize its profits. Do you really want your customers to use your service like once or a few times and then never have to use it again? Like, you know how people get so pissed off with the short battery life of Apple products and then after you buy one, you have to buy a new one in like two years? Apple wants you to keep buying their products. A for-profit company will always want people coming back. And there's something really insidious to me when that product is not like a phone but your mental health. If you are cured, they lose a customer. So is it in their best interest that you are cured? This is also kind of a problem with some meditation apps. It's more profitable for them that you aren't cured and then you keep coming back and they're like, hey, we have this band-aid solution for you again. This is really just treating the symptoms of the problem and not getting at the root causes, which are really complex and in some ways can be perpetuated by these kinds of for-profit companies. Or if they don't profit in money, they could profit in harvesting your data. Like Peter Thiel as a backer sounds pretty sketchy to me. I don't know, I could be wrong about this. I hope I'm wrong about this. That that they really do want you to be fully cured, but I'm still really wary. Some people in the psychedelic community are like, we cannot be divided about this. We need to stick together and get these psychedelics to some magical finish line. And then after that, then we can talk about things like accessibility and inclusivity and reciprocity. But I think that doesn't mean that we can't have discussions and conversations about this, even if we may disagree with each other. Maybe especially if we disagree with each other so we can talk it out and sort it out now um, and figure out the right path. Like in a world where psychedelics are only legal in a for-profit company terrain and not for personal use and these patterns are already in place, that kind of world is a lot harder to revert when it's already entrenched rather than just doing things the right way the first time. But in conclusion, that's why I've decided not to invest in these psychedelic companies like Compass Pathways and MindMed because their goals seem to not align with mine in terms of decriminalization and accessibility of quality in psychedelic therapy and open science in psychedelic research. I know that my decision will make a dent at all in these companies. I know they really don't give a fuck and I know they're gonna do fine without me not investing. And some of you may be like, well, that's your lost loser you're missing out on a great financial opportunity and you may just be in it for the money and if that's what you really value in life then you do you or you may genuinely believe that these companies are doing the right thing and this is the best way to heal people but for me I'm really just not comfortable investing in these companies and thereby supporting them by increasing their stock value and public perception just for my own monetary gain or clout when it really doesn't align with my moral compass I might make videos in the future about each for-profit company like compass and MindMed, looking at each one closer. Compass already kind of has a bad rep in the psychedelic stock investing community, but there are things that are well liked like MindMed, but they're also kind of doing some sketchy things, so maybe I'll make a video about that, I don't know. I haven't looked into every for-profit company in the psychedelic space closely, so there may be some okay ones, I don't know. I kind of have little faith in any company that is taking money from investors and thereby putting profits first. But as I said, I'm still learning and so I could share with you what I've learned. If you want to do your own research, I'll put some links below to help you get started, but what really helped me were Symposia's articles and podcasts on corporate delics 
And also this story by Here Now Studios called We Will Call It Paula that illustrates and builds upon Symposia's ideas. I tried my best to condense the information in this video, but there are a lot of complications and issues that I barely even touched on. It's like a rabbit hole. Once you start digging, there's just more and more. So yeah, I hope that gave you a different perspective on the psychedelic corporate space apart from these other psychedelic stock videos on YouTube. What I'll leave you with now is the one thing that really strikes me when I think about this stuff, and it's Maria Sabina, who if you didn't know, she was this Mazatec healer in Mexico who kind of inadvertently introduced the Western world to magic mushrooms, and she believed that magic mushrooms were medicine, and she would perform these ceremonies in her community to heal people for free, because she believed if she didn't, the magic mushrooms would not be the most effective. And I do believe that people should be compensated for their services, but I also think that's pretty admirable.